and marry your mom and have kids with her. Oedipus is like, dude, that's terrible. But his buddy tells him, you better listen to what that old man says because he's never wrong. Oedipus then, he's, he's old anyway, he does the next thing. He goes away. He leaves his mom and dad. He says, dude, I don't want to kill my dad and marry my mom, so I'm going to run away. I'm just going to go and leave town. He does. He is walking along the road. It's close to the crossroads where two roads cross. He sees somebody driving a chariot towards him. It's an old man. The old man's got a seriously bad temper, and he says, get out of the way. And Oedipus, who also has a bad temper, maybe like his old man, Oedipus says, up yours, I ain't getting out the way. There is a servant on the chariot, and the servant jumps off when the old man pulls the chariot over, and the old man and the young man have a fight. Oedipus, who is quite strong, kills the old man. The servant, who has jumped off the chariot, watching from behind the trees, now is worried, runs away, because, of course, he's afraid he might get jacked next. The young man, Oedipus, has just killed the king of Thebes, Laius. He does not know it. He walks down the road. At the crossroads is sitting a disturbingly terrible monster, the Sphinx. The Sphinx is sitting right outside the city of Thebes and has put a curse on the city. Now, the Sphinx is a scary monster. Head of a lion, body of a bird, all those kinds of things, right? The Sphinx will say to Oedipus, you are one jacked man, I'm going to kill you, but I'll give you a chance. I have a riddle. If you can answer my riddle, then I will leave you and the city alone. Oedipus is like, well, I'm going to die anyway. Give me the riddle. The question of the riddle of the Sphinx, it of course is very famous. If you don't know it, let's put it in our notes now. It's a simple question. What animal walks on four legs in the morning, on two legs at noon, and on three legs in the evening? What animal walks on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon, three legs in the evening? Well, Oedipus has been paying attention in his English class, and he realizes you can talk literally or you can talk metaphorically, figuratively. And he says, ah, oh, 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 you're talking metaphorically. A human walks on four legs in the morning of his life, crawling, 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 on two legs of his life at noon, in the middle of his life, but at the end of his life, in the evening, has to wear, has to use a crutch to walk because you get old, three legs in the evening. And the Sphinx goes, whoa, dude, you're smart. I'm going to leave you alone, and I'm going to leave the city of Thebes alone. And he leaves, and the plague on the city goes away. The drop-dead gorgeous queen, Jacusta, comes walking out of the city with all of the city there to meet the stunningly handsome young man, Oedipus. And she says, you are amazing. You're brilliant, you're beautiful, you're strong, and guess what? We just got bad news. Our king was killed. He's dead, and we need a new king. Would you like to marry me, come into the city, and become the king of this great city? Oedipus is thinking to himself, dude, this is the best day. Well, with the exception of that old man that I had to jack, but you know, he kind of deserved it. Oedipus goes into the city. Oedipus marries his mom. He doesn't know it's his mother, right? The way I've tried to say this is, imagine for a moment this story. You go away to college after you graduate from high school. At that university, you meet at a party this amazing person. You're at a dance, you meet them. This, this person is incredible. Finishes your sentences for you and stuff like that, right? I mean, you immediately become close friends and you decide, let's go ahead and get married and let's raise our children together. And you end up having four children. Two, let's say, two guys, two sons and two daughters. Your life is amazing. You live affluently. You do very well. You, you're, you're, you're happy in every way. And then one afternoon you get an email that says, when you were born, you were born actually a twin. You had a sister, you had a brother, whatever. But you were separated at birth and sent away. But your twin is alive. Now the only reason why you might at this moment be going, oh, that's disgusting, 
to realize that the person that you ended up marrying was actually your twin. The only reason why you would even begin to think about that is the story, right, of Oedipus. So you're like, oh, that is so cool. I'm going to have to run it down. Who is this person? Well, what do you know? She ended up, she ended up going to the same university as you. What are the odds? Wow. And then, of course, you come to discover. That's the point of this story. It is the dark, for your notes, it is the dark irony. Oedipus will marry his mother, have four children, two sons and two daughters, with his mother. Polynices, Etocles, the sons, Ismene and Antigone, the daughters. His life is going amazingly when all of a sudden a plague hits the city of Thebes, that cursed city, because of Cadmus, of course, cursed. The prophet will come and say to Oedipus, here's the problem. The king, Laius, was murdered. The, punish, uh, the, the murderer must be punished. Oedipus goes to the front of the stage and he says it this way. I promise you, this is what, by the way, for your notes, it had to be what we call dramatic or on stage irony. I promise you, I will get to the bottom of this and the murderer of King Laius will be punished. Through the next moments of the play, Jacusta, wife, mother of Oedipus, begins to kind of get a sense that maybe something is wrong here. She tells her boy, husband, Oedipus, why don't you just drop this? Oedipus, no. I have a job to do. I will do that job well. I have to find out who the killer of Laius was. I will not rest till I find out. From two different sides of the stage walk on two different people. The first messengers. The first one says, good news, bad news. Bad news? I'll give it to you first. Your mom and dad who raised you, your mom and dad, they just died. Good news, you don't have to worry about killing your dad, marrying your mom. You can come back anytime you want now to visit. The other one walking onto the stage is the servant who was on the back of the chariot with Laius. And the minute he walks on stage, he looks at Adam and he goes, goes, hey, dude, you're the guy. You're the one I saw. What saw? What are you talking about? At the crossroads. You're the one that I saw. You killed, you killed Laius. It's at that moment that Oedipus realizes he's done something terrible. He realizes he's killed his own father. He realizes he's married his own mother. He turns to find Jacusta, his wife, mother. She's gone. He runs off stage. A messenger comes on stage because Sophocles won't put this actually on stage to show us. And the messenger tells us what happened next. What happened next is increasingly more and more tragic. Jacusta, in her shame, goes to her bedroom and hangs herself. Oedipus finds her dead. Oedipus then has to make an interesting decision. Does he also commit suicide? No. Instead, Oedipus grabs these brooches that are on her dress that have these pokey things, these pins at the back, and he shoves them into his eyes and he blinds himself. Note the irony. At the moment Oedipus goes blind, he can see. See what he's done. In his shame, at the very end of the play, he's led onto stage by the only one of his four children who will stand by his side, Antigone. His other daughter, Ismene, outraged and runs away. His two sons, Polynices and Tocles, turn around and immediately get ready to start having a fight about who gets to be king because obviously dad Oedipus won't be king anymore. Creon, who is the brother of Jacusta, you can start to think about the ways in which this family dynamic starts to get messy. Creon is now going to name himself king. On his way out the door, Oedipus and Creon speak. Oedipus asks one question. Will you promise me you will take care of my children. Creon says, I will if you promise that you will never come back to this city of Thebes. Oedipus says, I will never come back. I will leave and, and not come back. Oedipus ends up going to a place called Colonus, and it will be there two important things happen for him. One, he will learn that his sons, Polynices, Etocles, they have killed each other outside the walls of Thebes, 
fighting over who will become king of Thebes. Polynices was actually uh, um, go, uh, fighting against the city of Thebes. Eteocles was defending the city of Thebes for, for uh, Creon, the king. So there is a law that will soon be passed that says, Eteocles will be properly buried. Polynices will not be properly buried. The other thing that happens, Oedipus at Colonus will die. Our story now turns to the plight of Antigone. Antigone meets her sister Ismene, and she says, Have you heard this thing about uh, our, our uncle Creon has said that we're not allowed to bury the body of our own brother, Polynices, and if we are going to bury him, that we will end up punished by stoning. The way they would stone you, a hole in the ground, dug deep enough for your shoulders. Professional stoners, not making this up, professional stoners throw rocks at the body, not hitting you to kill you, hitting you to punish you. The rocks hit your body, fall into the hole, the hole fills up, then pick up a big rock, bring it over, drop it on your head to kill you. It also provides the burial as well, kind of nice. That's what will happen if anybody buries the body of Polynices. Antigone says to her sister, we got to bury the body. Ismene's like, are you insane? We're women. Men make rules. We follow the rules because we're women. Antigone says to her, to her sister Ismene, you're a wimp. I'll do it by myself. Creon is told, somebody has buried the body of Polynices. Creon is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Everybody knows what the rules are. Everybody knows the punishment that's coming. Who would have done it? Go and find who buried the body of Polynices. On stage comes Antigone. And she will say to Creon, yeah, I did it. Of course I did it. There are rules about how you're supposed to take care of your family. He was my brother, just like Etocles was my brother. Of course I buried him. And of course I know I'm going to die, but who cares? I did the right thing. Creon now is stuck. He's made a rule that he's going to have to keep. He says, you know what? I'm going to punish both you and your sister because I'm sure she had a part to play in this. Antigone says, this many had nothing to do with this. It was totally me. She's let off stage. Onto the stage comes Creon's son, Haman, his only son. Haman and Antigone are a thing. Haman walks up to his dad and he says, hey, listen, you know I love you, but you're doing something really stupid here. This is not a good idea. You shouldn't have ever made the law to not bury the body of Polynices because you know what the gods think about that kind of thing of disgracing the body of the dead. You definitely made a mistake. Why don't you just change your mind? Creon to his boy. Are you serious with me? You need to just back off now. First off, I'm the king. You're the subject. Second, I'm the father. You're the son. You can go find another girl because I know that's exactly why you're here. The only reason you're here is because you're in love with Antigone. You can find another girl to love. Haman says to his father, if you do this, you will never see me again. Creon's like, whatever. Haman leaves. The blind prophet Tiresias shows up. Now, Tiresias is an interesting cat. He's the guy who's blind, but he can see. He sees the past, he sees the future. Why? Because Tiresias has lived two lives. Remember, the Greeks believe in reincarnation. So you can live multiple lives. But you drink from the river Lethe and you forget your prior lives. Tiresias, however, has lived both the life of a man as well as the life of a woman. And, most importantly, he remembers both of those lives. He's the only one who ever completely will ever understand both men and women. And he knows the future. And he walks into Creon and he goes, you are an idiot. You better go bury the body of Polynices, and then you better go take care of that young girl Antigone. By the way, Creon has decided in his justice to not actually kill Antigone, but to leave her in a cave with a little bit of food locked up so she'll starve to death, as if somehow I guess that's more humane. At first, Creon fights with Tiresias, and he says, somebody's paid you off, haven't they, to say this to me? And, and Tiresias is like, I'm a blind old man. Do I look like I need money from you? Give me a break. Ultimately, Creon will decide, you know what, I probably should go with the help of the chorus who will say to him, you bet, Tiresias is never wrong. You better go take care of your business here. And so Creon will run 
to bury the body of Polynices like you should have done all along. And then he shows up at the cave where Antigone is buried, but the stone has been moved. And from inside of the cave, he hears a man's voice screaming in agony. When he gets inside the cave, it's his son, Haman. Antigone has hanged herself. And Haman is there holding on to her body. When Haman sees his father, he's outraged. He draws a sword. He tries to kill his own father, but he can't do it, so he falls on his own sword. Haman kills himself. When the messenger gets back to the city of Thebes, the messenger will tell the queen, Creon's wife, the queen, your son is dead. He's killed himself. And she will in turn kill herself. Again, for your notes, talk about your cursed family, right? Dysfunctional family. The end of this play, the play Antigone, will have Creon the father, broken now, come onto the stage with the dead body of his son and lie it down on stage. And the final words of Creon, I'm Jack. I'm Jack. There's, no, there's nothing I can do that can ever now fix my life. And there even seems to be a suggestion that maybe Creon's going to go off to commit suicide himself. The final story, by the way, from this royal house of Thebes that Hamilton will tell is the Seven Against Thebes. I don't have much to say about this play other than to say this is the explanation for how the city of Thebes was destroyed by the Athenians because... Creon would not allow proper burial for Polynices and the others that were a part of that fight to try and take some part of the governance of Thebes. Well, let's do level two, level three really quickly. At level two A, well, messages, themes. I mean, think about this one. You can obviously do bad things innocently, but you still get jacked for it. And by extension, because this is the focus for this lecture, notice how the stuff that Cadmus did redounds onto the family of Oedipus and Antigone and, of course, Creon. At 2B, let's mention it again. Irony. This is not a play, for example, or a story where Oedipus says, yay, I get to kill my dad and marry my mom and have four kids. No, no, no. It is done unintentionally. For your notes at 2B, that is the irony. The irony is you don't know that you're doing something really bad. You think you're doing something really good but it actually ends up being something really bad, right? Now, we should point out that the great philosopher Aristotle, in his classic text, Poetics, and I've given a full lecture on this elsewhere at LearnStrong.net, Aristotle says that the play by Sophocles, Oedipus Rex, that story of Oedipus, is the great play because of the idea for Aristotle that in a great play, a tragedy, you have what's called the pro Protagonist. That is the character with whom the audience most identifies with. And the protagonist will have a certain kind of hamartia or tragic flaw. Usually it's hubris, excessive pride. And as the protagonist falls, the audience will go through catharsis or purgation, the release of powerful emotions, two of them, fear and pity. As the audience watches Oedipus go down the tubes, the audience has to admit Man, that would stink to be him. And, right, of course, this is the fear part. Whoa, I could probably in my life have something that happens to me that I think is a good thing that I'm doing, but actually ends up being a terribly bad thing. Finally, at 3A, well, I mentioned it already. If you haven't read Sophocles' great plays, Oedipus Rex, Oedipus at Colonus, and Antigone, you need to do that. I hope that you'll take a look at that. Um, hey, think about it this way, at, 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 3B as, at, at 3A as well. If you know your Star Wars movies, and the very original one, why is it the case that Luke and Leia cannot become lovers, even though there seems to be a physical attraction there in that movie? Of course, the answer is, well, they can't become lovers because they are brother and sister. They were separated at birth. Where would Lucas get an idea like that? Well, of course, as we have said many times, these are the stories that, uh, these Greek stories are the stories that will impression so many thinkers and writers, and yes, movie makers, right? Finally, at 3B, how about this one? Jot this one down as a possible 3B question. One time in your life that you can remember where you did something that you were thoroughly convinced was a good thing, no question 
This is the good act. This is the right thing. In every way, you were thoroughly convinced it was the right thing to do. And it turned out to be maybe one of the worst things you ever did in your life. Can you jot that one down? If you are playing that game, you're playing the game of Oedipus, are you, right? All right, let's go to chapter 19, the final chapter in this, this whole notion of the cursed families, the royal house of Athens. And we will begin here with Serops. Um, um, Serops um, was the first king of Attica, and he makes Athens the city of Athena. Now, why did the city called Athens, become the city of Athena. There's a number of different stories here. One of them is fascinating. In the early days, we're told, in Athens, women had the right to vote. So the question was, who will be the god or goddess of our city? There was one more woman than there were men, and the women all voted for Athena, and that's why the city is called Athens. Hmm. Well, Serops was the great-grandfather of Theseus, that great hero that we talked about before. One of the stories from this family is the story of Procene and Philemon. They are two sisters, and this is an interesting story. Procene is married to Tereus. Tereus is interested in Philemon. And so he takes Philemon, and he will try to seduce her. When she says no, he does the unthinkable. He cuts out her tongue so that she can never tell her sister that her sister's husband tried to seduce her. Philema, however, locked away and speechless, will weave a tapestry that will tell the story of her undoing, and she will send it to her sister. Procina is so upset that Procini will kill her own son that she's had with Tyrius and serve it up to Tyrius to eat 